share with us? What's happened this week that you want to brag about? Um, share with us. Come on, come on. We're shy. <laughs> Remember to unmute yourself. Wow, you guys have never been this quiet. I had seven closings last week. Yes, I remember about that. I remember that as well. <laughs> Would you say? I said I remember all of those. Oh. <laughs> Incredible. Way to go. That is awesome. What else? It was an absolutely gorgeous day yesterday, and it's beautiful today. Yes, well, that's so nice. Oh. Santosh, aren't you celebrating an anniversary or something last week? We did. We, we did. we actually celebrated on Saturday of our 40th. Awesome. Congrats. Congrats. Congratulations. Thank you. Awesome. Well, what else? Anybody else? Last chance? All right, moving on. We're going to talk about some birthdays. October 15th, that's tomorrow. Taylor Maupin and Aaron Voorhees. 17th is Rick Cook and Taria Wyatt. Happy birthday. October 18th is Rob Deaver. Happy birthday, Rob. And then on the 19th, we've got Pam Hawkins and Heidi Four. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. We have some new people joining us. Welcome. James Hellinger, Lee Hellinger. They are both going to be on Becky Lush's team. Devonta Taylor is going to be on Crystal Corrigan's team. Uh, Abby Harrett is on Denise Wisdom's team. Adam Thomas is on Lindsay Blandingham, Blandingham's team. <laughs> Sorry, Lindsay. <laughs> uh, Wade Williams is on the Price Group. Now, welcome. Welcome, everybody. We're so happy. Awesome. We're glad you're here. Our quote of the day. Master your expenses. The first dollar you make is the first dollar you don't spend. Gary Keller, <laughs> very apt for our finance committee meeting today. And now we have a special guest, and I think Linda is going to introduce our special guest, Carla Higgins. Oh, okay. I guess I better come off mute. Carla Higgins, are you on the call with us today? I am. Where are you? There she is. Hey. Well, it's we are so proud to uh, introduce to you Carla. Carla is going to be our new productivity coach, and we're so excited about this. And she has an amazing track record. She's all the way up in Indianapolis. And Carla, how about you tell them about you and what this program is going to look like? Awesome. Yeah, I am so excited. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to to join you today for a few minutes. So I am a productivity coach up in Indianapolis um, in two market centers, Indy Metro South and Indy Metro Northeast. And I am joining you guys. Uh, one of the gifts of COVID is we get to do so many things by uh, this virtual platform. So it allows us to do things. Plus I'm gonna come down and get to visit you guys. I get to say y'all when I come down there, right? Or all y'all, something like that. <laughs> Just kidding. But I'm, I'm really excited. I do, some of you got emails from me. I am having a, a Zoom uh, informational session uh, tonight at 6 p.m. and uh, tomorrow um, at 7 p.m. I can check those times. I wrote those down and I think I wrote those down wrong. What did I so tell you guys in my email? Sorry about that. <laughs> I was just got off of the regional call and a little lost. So anyways, it is uh, tonight uh, at six o'clock and uh, tomorrow at 9.30 in the morning. So it's, I put a morning one in there. I knew I'm going to put this in the chat for you guys along with the Zoom link. So if you're interested, hop on and I can tell you about productivity coaching and what we can do to grow your business, get your new agents into production as quickly as possible and to the closing table. Thank you. Yeah, guys, the, she is off to a great start in Indianapolis and um, working with two other market centers there with an amazing track record. She also does, um, aren't you going to be doing some sort of a program for people getting their license, like a study group for help them pass there? Oh, That's absolutely. a key thing. 
Absolutely. So if you guys know any new agents, this is a great way for you guys to build your profit share. You can send them up my way. I have an exam study group. And as you guys probably maybe remember, the national part of the test is the tough one. So we meet every uh, Saturday from uh, 1130 to 130 and it's via Zoom. And it's, a, it's really a mastermind. I also have a Facebook group that if you have any new recruits, you can send them there. There's recordings of the past study groups and a lot of really great study materials. So that is a really great way for you guys to build your profit share by introducing people to that group. And our coaching program is also, we have a workshop on Saturday mornings. So if you have any dual career, um, if you, have, if you guys are dual career agents and you're worried about how you can uh, fit productivity coaching into your schedule, we have lots of evening and Saturday um, programs as well. Thank you, Carla. We look forward to seeing you on our team. I am so excited. Thank you. And I'm gonna pop this information in chat for you guys too. Great, right. thanks. I do not believe we have Harry or Brad on. Am I, am I missing you, Harry or Brad? Yeah, yeah he's here. Oh, okay, perfect. Sure. Here is oh, Brad. Hello. You can just talk. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> I didn't. I just walked in. Uh, Santos said he had a question for Harry or, or me. So, Santos, you got a question? Yeah. I wanted to. Yeah, I can't hear you. In here. Harry, uh, sometimes we can't hear you. That is your piece. I muted myself. Okay, agency consumer guide. We typically have that sign very first thing, but now that we're going with electronic routes, when we send the documents over to the clients, agency disclosure may not be the first document that they sign. Generally, you're not going to be in trouble at all. But if something goes wrong, they're going to look at date stamp and say, hey, you did not get the consumer guide signed uh, up front. That could be a problem. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, either uh, Brad or Harry to address that. Well, they changed, they changed the rules regarding the consumer's guide. It used to be uh, up until May, it was required um, either after the second contact or after confidential information was disclosed. That has changed and now you just have to have it signed you, you get it signed when you when you write up the the offer so the rules changed back in may when the when the form itself changed so that does not need to be the first document that we signed okay okay all right so the next question i have is regarding uh inspection i think there's a lot of discussion when we can get out of the contract Right. So this, this language says that buyer has hired a licensed inspector or licensed professional. So you have, we know the licensed inspector. We know the licensed professional, which is HVAC contractor, electrical contractor, plumbing contractor. But this really does not cover termite inspection. So can you just do a termite inspection and say, hey, this was a professional we want to get out of the contract. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, whenever people use the inspection contingency to terminate, because really they change their mind. It's not that they just want out, which is our contract gives them that right. So yes, yes, a termite, legally per the contract, a termite inspection will get you out of the contract. However, a lot of sellers will get mad when you do that because they will say you're not acting in good faith. And they may or may not sign the termination, which means you may or may not get the good faith check back um, right away. You may have to, may have to send a 60 day letter or, or whatever. So yes, it, 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 per the contract, it is enough. And per the contract, if you had a hairdresser do an inspection and provide a report, then that would be enough. But, um, Again, you're looking at, at people get angry when people when people change their mind, uh, and now it's happening. I've been on the phone nonstop since nine o'clock this morning with agents whose buyers are changing their mind. In many cases, in two cases, outside of the, the inspection, uh, totally outside of the inspection time frame. So, um, yes, 
termite inspection per the contract will get you out. However, it may not get you out immediately because they may accuse you of, or your buyer of not acting in good faith. Does that help? Yep. yep. All right. Uh, one last question for you. Dang, man, you're keeping uh, me. <laughs> Thank this time. Uh, uh, so uh, a guy decides to buy a home. He's married. Does he have to have his wife on the deeds? Yeah. When he gets ready to sell, yes, the wife has to sign off on it. But on the front end, cannot he go out and buy the property without his wife being on the deed? Yes, unless the mortgage company says no. If it's okay. a cash transaction, yes, he can. Or he can buy it with someone else. Uh, pardon me? His mistress or what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Yeah. I had that happen one time. Yes. Stop! Uh, uh, yeah, this, this was not intended to leave ladies out, but you know, uh, this, this does come up from time to time. <laughs> if the mama says no, he cannot do it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, you, you, you can, but if, if there's a mortgage involved, the, the lender may require both, both people be on there. It just, it just depends. But there's also other ways. Harry has sneaky legal ways to get around that as well. So if you need to, to do that, give him a, give him a shout, and he can, uh, can can advise you in a much better, much more legal fashion than I can. So I have a similar question, Brad. Okay. If you have a buyer who has a co-signer on their loan, does the co-signer have to sign the contract? Um, if the co-sign, can you hear me when you do yeah. that? Okay. Yes. Yeah. If the contract. They, they should be on there. It, 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 it's kind of like a, a gift, like daddy's providing the gift funds. Well, if um, daddy changes his mind, that, that doesn't get the kid out of the contract. So uh, if you want, they should be on the contract because that way that yeah. if they change their mind, they're still legally bound to the contract. Does that make sense? But, but if, if this is a co-signer, then absolutely, they're actually using their credit to buy the property, so they should be on the contract. They should definitely be on the contract. Brad, I don't know if this is a legal question or if you can answer it or anybody else. So I had a client today ask me if they were to, out of the proceeds of their house, gift their children some money do you know if there's tax ramifications or if there's a limit? I know there's a there's a limit on gifts. I don't know what it is now. Is it like forty thousand, ten thousand? I don't know. I'm not an accountant, but it was ten thousand per year per per parent. I don't know if that's changed. Do you know if yeah, that's per child? I I thought it was higher than that. Yeah, but it's gone yeah. up. Yeah, I don't know. But I have no I, idea. That, that would be a CPA. that would be a CPA question. Yeah. But the thing to remember there is like, if you're giving it to the son, you can give 10,000 or whatever the amount is to the son and his wife as well. Yes. Yeah. You can give it okay. to the daughter and their husband. So yeah. you could actually add up all of those funds. Yep. So encourage them to ask their accountant. Yes. Thank you. I've got a quick question. Um, I've got a VA seller um, that is going through a divorce. He bought the house on his own. They were married when they bought it, but now they're going to divorce. Okay. Uh, he may want to keep the house. So does he have to refinance that house? Um, was, she, was, she, uh, was the wife on the mortgage originally? Uh, no. Okay. Well, it just depends on the, divorce, the settlement because she, if, since they're married, have, have her house. So um, if she surrenders the house agreeably, then yes, but he can just move on. But it would all depend upon the, on the divorce, the divorce settlement, how that, how the house is handled. Okay. All righty. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else for Brad while he's here? Yeah. Can we go back to the agency relationship? Sure. Um, in Doug Myers' class on Thursday, our core, he's saying that we still need to have that sign prior to entering a written agreement, prior to ending the oral agreement, and prior to signing an agency consent agreement. Is that different uh, than what we just said? 
Well, yeah, I mean, if you, you would have it signed prior to, right? Again, it used to be the, the, real, the, the, the triggers change. The trigger used to be before, as soon as confidential information has been disclosed or upon the second meeting, that's changed. Yes, you have to get it signed when you're entering into a, if you're entering into a buyer's agency agreement, or if you write, most people have it signed when they're, before they write up an offer, which would satisfy what Doug is talking about. Uh, but again, the rules, rules have all changed. Uh, you're gonna have instructors teaching the different ways. All I can tell you is what the Real Estate Commission says when, when they put out their 360 page uh, booklet on the changes that happened back earlier in the year. And I went to that six hour class and that's what they say. What The way Doug interprets it, I don't know. I don't, haven't been to one of Doug's class in years because I fell asleep the last time I sat in one of his classes. And, uh, uh, anyway. Well, you know, it's cool where it's mandatory. We do what we can. What's that? It's core, it's mandatory, we do what we can. No, oh, I hear you. I'm <laughs> just saying I, uh, I shouldn't have said that out loud, but sometimes, I, sometimes I, my mouth works before my brain. <laughs> All I can tell you is what the commission says. And that's the, when, you write up, when, you, when you write up an offer, that's typically when you're gonna get it signed. But the reason is because back before they, were, before they changed the rules, nobody was getting them signed when they were supposed to. Nobody. They were getting them signed when they had to get them signed because it's a legally required form. And that was when they're writing up an offer or listing a property. So the real estate commission changed the rules. So that's my interpretation. Um, okay, thank you. Okay. Great, anything else? Anything else for Brad? Is, uh, is Colleen on this call? She is. We're going to introduce her here in a minute. I love Colleen. We I love her. Brad. Hi, Brad. I was so glad to be able to come to you guys today so I could get to see you all. Yeah, I know. I miss you. I wish you were standing here in person. Yeah, she is. Love the glasses, Colleen. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So tomorrow, 5 p.m., right here in the atrium, uh, group therapy, fountain therapy. I like that. Uh, you get to bring a chair. You get to bring your own drink. And uh, we're gonna hang out. Anything else that I'm missing about that, Amy? No, moving on. Hey, Santosh. Yes, we're gonna have this panel on Monday. We're gonna talk about short-term rentals. Chris Thomas, um, the guy who manages a whole bunch of um, short-term rentals, David Orange will be on it. And the two people from planning and design. Uh, uh, Joe Haberman is the head of uh, planning and design. Those guys will be on this call with us. And it'd be a lot of information as to what are the, the things uh, that govern uh, permitting and so forth. Uh, why is short-term rental very attractive financially? And uh, so a lot of information will be provided in that by this panel. So come and join us. Awesome, thanks Santosh. Coming up uh, October 20th is the next round of Bold Autumn Edition. You can register at mapscoaching.com and you can get all the information there. Everybody should sign up for that. It's awesome and it's very inexpensive right now. So it's your chance to get it done. Ignite begins October 26th. Um, it'll be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 to 11 a.m. And it looks like we have some great speakers. Uh, Rhonda Roberts is going to be Monday, October 26th from 9 to 11. Alyssa Withrow is going to be Wednesday, October 28th from 9 to 11. Uh, we have Justin Thomas on Friday, October 30th from 9 to 11. We have Denise Wisdom on Monday, November 2nd, 9 to 11. Libby Loser is November the 4th from 9 to 11. Andrea Walker is November the 6th from 9 to 11. Drew Wisdom, November the 9th, 9 to 11. Jessica Yu is November the 11th, 9 to 11. Marsha Duncan, November 13th, 9 to 11. 
Ruby Lozer again, cool. Uh, November 16th from 9 to 11. Vicki Yates is going to go over compliance on Wednesday, November the 18th from 9 to 11. And the 12th session is Linda Cecil, blast off, November 20th, 9 to 11. We also have these sheets laying up front on the counter if you guys want to grab one. Um, so you don't forget about all these great speakers we've got. That's on the 26th of October. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the deal this time is that anybody can pop in for any one of those sessions without taking all of Ignite. I'm not sure. Is that the case? That, that, is, that is correct. Um, although if someone is looking to become eligible for agent on call, um, they will need to attend regularly and I'll monitor that. More to come Perfect. on that. Great. Thanks. Okay. Up next, coming up on November 17th. This is great. This is the MREA business painting planning clinic. Uh, it's the perfect time of year for that, led by Jean Rivers. Wow, this is awesome. Um, November 17th, 845 to 430, and you can register on Eventbrite. Uh, wow, that's really cool. That's an opportunity to, to sit with a master and figure out how your business plan should look for 2021. That's great. Can I, can I share something about that, if you don't mind? Yeah. This is all new material. They've written all new material. So it's if you've taken business planning clinic in the past, this is uh, bigger and better. Gene Rivers is teaching it today, and there's over 500 people on that call right now listening to Gene Rivers. And this one will be open up to the pub, I mean, to the uh, nationwide Keller Williams. So it's going to be huge as well. It will sell out. Um, the one for today with 500 sold out, just like yesterday with uh, uh, Linda McKissick, that one sold out. So you're going to want to get your ticket for this one. And we are planning a workshop uh, shortly after that, like the next week, where you can actually come in and we're going to help you work out your business plan personally just for you. So watch for that as well. How much is it? Um, I think it was 99. I'll have to double check. I'll put it in the chat in a second. Um, this is also one of the courses that is eligible for the turkey gift basket giveaway as well. So you had Quantum Leap, uh, Bold, and the Business Planning Clinic. So if you register and attend all three of those courses, um, you get into the drawing of that fabulous turkey basket that we talked about last week. Are you talking about the one with the wild turkey in it? Just asking. Right. <laughs> asking for a friend. <laughs> All right. Up next, Rick Fields on November 19th, 11 o'clock. Accounting. It's all about taxes. Everybody's favorite. <laughs> Lindsay, know your numbers. Okay. okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> this um, so this is again talking about business planning time of year. This is a little bit of a review to help you with your business plan. Lindsay, um, we're getting a lot, of, or I'm getting a lot of feedback. Is anybody else? going? There's several of us in this room together. I'll try and. <laughs> If it's everyone actually, else turns yeah. their volume down, then yours won't get to Yes, if everyone can turn their volume down. Okay, so this may be review for some of you who've been doing this for a long time, but uh, review never hurts, right? So this is just a little formula, and there's a worksheet that I have that I've been happy to share with you um, to help you do this on your own. But essentially, to give you a, 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 a plan, a path, to go from what your personal income goal is. Sorry, it's too much feedback, Lindsay. I'll leave them. Okay. Is this better? Can you hear me better now? Thank you. Okay, great. They have all the other computers have left the room. And I'm in here by myself. <laughs> um, the, this is a path for you to take your income goal and, and walk it back to look at what your activities for the year need to look like to get you to that goal, okay? I kind of roughed some numbers here together, uh, showing you from an individual perspective versus a team member's perspective, um, obviously because the initial numbers are a little bit different. So on the first page here, you see if your income goal, uh, and again, I have a blank worksheet so you can fill in your own personal numbers, but if your income goal is to earn $50,000 to take home to your family, you need to 
look at that as a piece of the income that you need to generate for the year, because obviously we all have our Keller Williams expenses and our business expenses. So you wanna take your income goal, add in your cap uh, and your international expenses, and then add in your, your total business expenses for the year to come up with what your total income that you need to generate for the year should look like. And you start with that number, and let's say we're looking at this number of $85,000 is the income your business needs to earn this year. Then you need to take a look at what your average sales price is. And this is something that everyone should be tracking. Um, and, and if not, you know, we can help you with the finance team look at what your average sale price has been. Um, but you need to look at your average sales price and therefore your average commission. And we all know not every side of the transaction is always going to pay 3%. So you need to look at what on average you're earning on your commission based on your average sale price. And using that information, you're gonna see how many homes you need to sell to reach that, that $85,000 number, that commission number, uh, that business income number. So if your average commission is $6,000 per transaction, then to earn 85,000, you need to sell 15 homes this year. Okay, does that make sense? Moving on. All of us have some of those homes that we get under contract and they simply just don't close. So think about your years and, and on average how many times that happens to you for this arbitrary individual I put in that two of their contracts didn't close. So if you need 15 contracts and you know that on average two of yours don't close, you need to get 17 homes under contract in the year. Then we also have our fair share of clients who look at 45 houses and never close or never go under contract, right? So include those folks as well in your number. So you have, you have 15 that you need to close. You have two that you know probably just won't get there. And then you have maybe three clients that you just show houses to and they never put anything <laughs> under contract. So then that is gonna help you come up with the number of clients that you need to obtain in the year. This person needs to obtain 20 clients, given those numbers. So then look at your business and think about how many times do you need to go on an appointment in order to sign a new client? Uh, newer agents may have to go on more appointments to sign a client, more experienced agents. Maybe, maybe you're the agent who every appointment you go on, they sign, but know what that number looks like for you and you need to be tracking those sorts of things so that you can get this kind of information for your business. So maybe, you know, maybe you're at a point in your business where every other appointment that you go on, you're able to get them to sign and become a client of yours. So therefore, to get your 20 clients that you need for the year, you need to go on 40 appointments. Then, how many times do you have to have a conversation with somebody to schedule an appointment. Again, a number that you can track from your daily lead generation. So again, ranging on, on how good you are with your scripts, how many conversations, you know, how many conversations you're able to have, what the, what the goal of those conversations is and who you're talking to is going to determine how many conversations you need to have to get an appointment. But knowing that number will really help you with your income goals. So if you know that you need 50 conversations in order to schedule appointments, an appointment, then you know that it's going to take you 2,000 conversations this year to schedule your 40 appointments. That sounds like a lot, but we'll break it down a little bit. Taking a look at your year, maybe you know that you want to take three weeks of vacation this year or five weeks of vacation or 20 weeks of vacation. I don't know. Whatever you want to take. Put in the number of weeks that you intend to work this year. These are five-day work weeks. So this individual says, I'm going to work 49 weeks this year and I'm going to take three weeks of vacation. So you're going to take that number of 2,000 contacts that you needed to have and divide that over your 49 weeks. That means every week you need to have 41 conversations with people, which is a little bit more of a manageable number, right? It's 2,000 seems overwhelming, but maybe 41 per week doesn't seem so bad. So think about in your business, how many times do you have to dial that phone before somebody picks up? Um, or how many text messages do you have to send? And so an, again, a number that you need to know for your own business, a rough idea. And so maybe every, every third time that you dial the phone, somebody picks up and you're able to have that conversation. So if you need 
41 contacts a week and it takes you three calls to get a contact, you need to have 123 uh, dials, dial the phone 123 times in a week so that you can obtain that number. And again, that feels like a big number, you know, 123 times dialing the phone seems like a lot, but when you break that down over a five day work week, that means that you're dialing the phone 25 times a day, which really doesn't seem, you know, too daunting. So essentially taking you from the information that, you know, how do I get to this number? Where, how, how do I obtain my financial goal? And you can set these numbers to be whatever you want and back end it and see how that works for you. You could also do it the opposite direction. I don't want to dial the phone more than 30 times a day. What does that mean I'm going to make this year? And you can go both directions with that. Excuse me. So how do you improve your numbers? Where, how do you make these better? Um, obviously, you can work on increasing your average sales price um, by, you know, making contacts in, in, within neighborhoods that you want to focus on, hosting open houses in neighborhoods that might help you increase that average sale price a little bit by obtaining the clients from those neighborhoods. You can also focus on who you're calling for that appointment conversion. Um, if, you're, if you're making 50 calls before you get an appointment, how could you get that number to 40 calls to make an appointment, for example? Make sure you're calling the, the easiest people to convert and you're not just, you know, maybe just, you know, dialing random numbers or something. Um, and then finally, education, of course, will help you improve your number. As I mentioned, script practice will help you convert appointments uh, more quickly, convert appointments to clients more quickly. Um, it might help you take that number of clients, you know, we had three people in there this year who just looked at houses forever and never bought anything. Education might help you convert that to a smaller number and be able to have less loss in your numbers. So that's just a, a general idea of, you know, how you can help those numbers get better over time. That's the end for me. Any questions? I hope that's helpful. I have the blank worksheet if anybody wants it to sort of backtrack into those things for yourself. Okay. Thank awesome. You, Make sure you send that out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. right. Great job, Lindsay. Great job. We'll have you teach in business planning clinic. <laughs> hey, everybody. We've got an amazing young woman on our, uh, as our guest today, um, Ms. Colleen Younger. Gosh, it's so good to see you. <laughs> Come off mute. Yeah, let me tell you a little bit about Colleen. Uh, Colleen was a life, had, has had a lifelong commitment to public service and has a passion for her hometown. She began her career in government with Mayor Sloan and Abramson in the Department of Neighborhoods, working to solve urban problems. The role led her a new challenge to be a project manager for Operation Brightside, where she developed a nationally acclaimed summer work program for at-risk youth. Um, after an award-winning career in real estate with an amazing company called Keller Williams, just happened to say that by chance, specialized in a new construction sales and training new realtors, she returned to the public sector <clears throat> and joined the Jefferson PBA as the Executive Director of External Relations. She created the first program that began PBA to the people that brings PBA to the people. She introduced an online tool to help home and business owners navigate the assessment appeals process. Before being elected PBA, Ms. Younger uh, last served as that office's uh, chief of staff. Uh, she is a notable advocate for strong neighbors. She's just a notable advocate for anything that's right for the people in our community an amazing public servant and somebody I consider very near and dear. And I um, think the world of you, Miss Colleen. So give us some wisdom. Oh, golly. Thank you so much. How do I even, how do I even follow that? Linda, thank you. I am really delighted and honored to be with you all today. You, you know, Keller Williams, Keller Williams people are my peeps, as, as a lot of you all know. Um, my, uh, my niece, Molly Younger, who's a practicing real estate agent, was one of the uh, people along with the Pinellas and Trish and Natalie, who actually, and Lynn and Perry, brought Keller Williams to Louisville. And, uh, and then she became uh, a part of that Younger Gaines team. And then I became a team leader for Keller Williams. So um, some of my greatest professional memories are as the team leader for Keller Williams Highlands office 
And uh, I, I actually survived that through the, uh, through the downturn of the market and uh, have made great lifelong friends like Brad Long, like Linda, like the Pinellas. I mean, you guys are just amazing. And as I was sitting here listening to all of your uh, things that are going on, you know what? I'm not surprised because that is the KW model. That is the culture. And I just was, I was looking through uh, some of the stuff on, on KW today before I got on the call. And, you know, one of my favorite things was the culture there, obviously. And uh, the culture will change your life. It really will change your life. And, and I still today practice the Y4C2Ts. And so, you know, I am really honored to be a part of you guys today and, and have just a few minutes to tell you about how I've taken part of my experience and principal uh, beliefs uh, that I learned at Keller Williams onto my next level uh, in life, which has been to be an elected official as the PVA. Who would have thought it? I mean, really. Um, so anyway, uh, let me just say I got elected in 2018. And uh, you've learned a little bit about me through my, through my bio. And we are doing things that really, I believe, are transforming uh, the PBA office. Because a long time ago, when I was at Keller Williams, one of the best things I learned was you got to get in business with the right people. And, and getting in business with the right people will help you change your life and achieve your goals. And so that's what uh, I'd like to do today is to introduce the staff members that are on this call with me. I have our longtime uh, uh, PVA employee staffer now, director of, uh, uh, we call them satellite cities, but they're actually officially home rule cities and our customer service person, and that's Melody Humphrey. And we call Good her morning. the great we call her the great Oz there at the PVA because she is the great Oz and she has a lot of information and experience. So if you ever need anything uh, from the PVA that you have a question about, call the great Oz, that's Melody Humphrey. And I have our director of communications who joined us in February, who came from a career in TV and that's Ashley Tenius, Ashley. And then we also have our director of signature programs who is Evan Westfall. Evan came with us uh, in January of 2019, I think, or maybe at one, uh, right when I got uh, elected. And Evan is, uh, is doing a great job with signature programs like our You Have a Right to Appeal. Because at the PVA, as much as we have a right to assess your property or reassess your property, you as the property owner have a right to appeal. And so we are making it as easy and as accessible as possible to help you appeal your property value. And we're doing that by going out into the community, PVA to the people. Uh, we're going into libraries every year uh, when it's not a pandemic, of course. And we are setting up shop. Bye, Brad, good to see you. We are setting up shop, uh, uh, which is going to allow you to come right to your neighborhood library and appeal your property value. We'll have staff on hand there to uh, be able to assist you, walk you through that property appeal so that you can be successful, let you know exactly what we need from you and how to help you or your clients to be successful in appealing their property value. Uh, that actual program uh, became a, a, a uh, nominee for a very uh, presti prestigious award uh, through Route 50 government awards and we were in the company of uh, a lot of pretty high up folks like governors and secretaries of state in different states and and we didn't win that uh, that year but we certainly were glad to be nominated for an award in that category. Um, one of the other things we're doing is we are doing a special project that is kind of my pet project. I, I love this kind of stuff because I grew up in a neighborhood's uh, environment and I'm a real estate agent. So I love neighborhoods and I love real estate. And so we're doing what's called story maps and we're going to be putting a story map on our website. So I know a lot of you guys work with, you know, relocation customers. They'll be able to go right to our website and say they want to live in St. Matthews. They can put in St. Matthews, click on that story map and everything about St. Matthews that they want to know is going to come right up housing stock, median, median home value, schools, uh, data that they wouldn't normally be able to get, and a little bit of history about that neighborhood. So we're really excited about that. We're going to cover all 
uh, of the organized neighborhoods in Louisville that have a an organized neighborhood association like Schnitzelberg, uh, you know, um, uh, Tyler Park, those kind of neighborhoods are going to be on there, as well as the home rural cities. So um, you'll be able to click on a map and that neighborhood will come up and it will show you a lot of information about your neighborhood uh, that you're that you're interested in learning about. So we hope that you will uh, take that story map, push it out to your folks, and uh, and use it to build your business. Uh, certainly use it in your listing presentations and and all of those kinds of things that uh, that you do on a daily basis in in trying to to find uh, customers. You'll you'll have a lead uh, on that or a. a, a not a lead, but a, but a leg up on getting to know about those neighborhoods through using our website, which most of you all are already a member. Um, I'll talk a little bit about reassessment. Reassessment is actually uh, coming up uh, January 1st of 2021 again. Uh, this year, I'll tell you what we did in, in 2020 uh, to sort of deal with this pandemic. Because we were doing, we, we operate on a quad plan that is approved through the Department of Revenue. That means that that quad plan is going to bring us to your area once every four years. So you can count on your property being reassessed once every four years. And so this year we were going to be doing about a third of the uh, parcel count in Jefferson County, which would be over 100,000 parcels, very large reassessment. And um, we were doing, as, as you would know, uh, MLS areas two, three, and seven, all very dense areas of town. We're talking about the Highlands, we're talking about Germantown, St. Matthews, um, Beechwood Village, uh, all, you know, all the way out, you know, to J-Town and um, in Crescent Hill, some of those real dense inner city areas. And so because we weren't going to be able to accommodate uh, a potential appeals from tax from property owners we decided to adjust our reassessment and modify our quad plan uh, to include only new construction and um, all the sales transfers any uh, improvements that we we get from permits and then the regular neighborhood reassessment we made a decision to roll forward to 2021 so that we could ensure that we would be able to work with any property owner that was going to uh, appeal their property value. So nothing worse than getting, you know, a higher tax bill uh, and not have had the opportunity to appeal your property value. So because of that, we rolled it forward. So now 2021 reassessment is going to be areas two, three, seven, and we've added five and six in there in keeping with what our regular quad plan would have been. So this year, or actually 2021, we are going to do the largest reassessment possibly <laughs> in PVA history. So we will be out there, the libraries I'm sure will are reopened now and we'll be out there in your neighborhood if you live in those areas, we will be out there ready to help you uh, uh, identify what you need in order to be successful in appealing your property value. Uh, there are four uh, levels to your property value and or, uh, to appealing it. The first one is to conference with the PVA. That's the first step. The second one is to go to the local board. If you're not pleased with what we say and we, we sustain your value or, or maybe you feel like we haven't lowered it enough, then you can take that to the next level of recourse, which is the local board of tax appeal. And then the third one would be to go to the state uh, uh, Kentucky Board of Tax Appeal. That's the next level, step three. And then step four would be taking it all the way to a circuit court. And sometimes that happens with larger corporations. And, uh, and we try uh, very hard to, to work with uh, the community, whether it's a residential customer or, or a commercial customer, and trying to help you get uh, to the correct property value. Because, you know, our, our uh, direct uh, uh, push from the Constitution is that we have to have fair and equitable, equitable property values. And we do that through, you know, 100% uh, uh, fair cash value 
uh, uh, analysis, and we do that through mass appraisal. We don't get a chance to, with 300,000 uh, parcels in Jefferson County, we don't get a chance to look at every individual property. So we do it on a mass scale and we have a computer assisted program that helps us do that. And so what we do is we get the deeds every day from the county clerk, we put them into a system. That system then gives us a median property value for say St. Matthews. And then when we are reassessing, we adjust that value up or we adjust it down based on the ratio that we are given through the Department of Revenue. And that ratio is, I think it's, uh, it's a window or, it's a ratio of uh, 90 to 110 percent. So if we fall within that proper ratio of reassessment, you're probably going to be okay for a while. But if you fall below that or above that, you can pretty much count that your property value is going to change. So if you're 110, we're going to adjust it down. If you're 85, we're going to adjust it up. And that's 85 percent of fair cash value. Uh, we use only arm's length transactions, so we're not using, uh, you know, a, a father to son, a mother to daughter, family transactions, uh, adverse possessions like foreclosure, foreclosures, those kinds of things. So that's how we uh, arrive at our 100% fair cash value of uh, property assessments throughout Jefferson County. I feel like I've spewed off a lot of information. Uh, I, uh, I do want to say to the new agents on here, you really are, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on this call with you, I am a believer in the Keller Williams model. Uh, you are in the best real estate company in the world. You really are. And I will tell you that, that the teachings, the, the classes, the education, uh, the, the profit share, the culture, there's nothing like it and I've been around a little bit, and I've seen a lot of different models. There's nothing like it. You know, going to a family reunion uh, is an amazing thing to get to, you know, to see these giants that, uh, that were the architects of this model, Gary Keller. I don't, is Mo still, is Mo still alive? Is Mo, is she still around? Oh my gosh. Uh, all, you know, Jean Rivers, Linda McKissick, who I absolutely adore. All those people are, uh, Amazing, Nikki. Uh, you, Nikki begins with a U. I can't remember it. Uvalde, mm -hmm. and and all those people, Kim, uh, all those folks that are really KW giants who have uh, brought this model to cities and helped people to really be able to live their dream through a real estate career. So that's my advertisement for KW, and that's all my information for the PVA. And we're going to open it up for questions. And first of all, let me ask my staff if they have anything to, to add to what I said. Um, Colleen, I do. I do want to say that um, if you have buyers that are over the age of 65 or if they are disabled, please make sure that they sign up for their homestead or disability exemption on their new homes. Um, that exemption costs them nothing and it does save them money on their taxes. It's a simple form that they can get from our website that needs to be filled out. It's five questions. It needs to be returned with a copy of their driver's license. Um, we can also send that out to them if they just want to give us a call, but just make sure they fill that out and get that in. Great. Thanks, Mel. Anyone else? Colleen? Yes. Hi, Brad. Brad. Um, and I think Melody was here last time you guys were here. You look very familiar. He uh, was. Uh, something that you guys talked about last time that was very informative and I think would help some of the newer uh, people is like you, we all go to the PBA every day and we see those square footage uh, numbers that you guys have. Could you speak real briefly about how where those come from and um, how they may or may not be something we, we would put a lot of uh, right. faith in. Right. Well, one of the reasons that I think, uh, you know, they, they don't want you to use PVA square footage is because, first of all, our square footage is not warranted. So then it becomes somewhat of a legal issue. But the PVA uh, only gets to measure the outside uh, of the property. So, uh, you know, we are measuring the, the actual, um, you know, sketch so to speak, of the property. 
And um, so it's not, it is not uh, a warranted uh, amount of square footage. There may, be, there may be square footage that we miss or we don't get or, uh, and, and you wanna make sure that, you know, you're, as, a, as a real estate agent, that you're giving uh, everything that the seller deserves or the buyer deserves in, their, in, in this home uh, because, you know, oftentimes there are, uh, diff there are people who, who do projects, they don't, uh, they don't pull a permit, you know, those kinds of things. So um, that's why we, we uh, you know, we say that our uh, square footage is not warranted. And um, I think recently they kind of changed some of the law, didn't they, Brad? Because a lot of agents were using PVA square footage and probably found some error in that maybe. Well, they, you no longer have the option of, of, of the drop, the PVA is no longer on the drop down list. Right. Most of the square footage. However, there's a lot of agents still using your all's numbers and choosing other as, as, as the source. Okay. So the Melody, do you have anything you'd like to add to that, Mel, on the square footage? Yes. Yeah. Um, you, oh, go ahead, Melody. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to add. Um, a big problem is, of course, we're not allowed inside the property, so there's things that um, we don't we don't know. So we don't know if that is actually a second floor. So we don't have that square footage, because um, a lot of people they don't they don't notify us, and if they didn't get a permit, then we would have no idea. So um, yeah, that's why it's not a good idea to use it. And if you come across a house that has it, you're welcome to send us an email to let us know if you're listing a house that has that something that's incorrect on the PVA site, please let us know. Right. Yeah, we're glad to make any correction. You know, we, we are, we have, you know, as I said, 300,000 parcels uh, in the, uh, in Jefferson County. And, you know, we don't, we do not claim to know everything about every single parcel. And in fact, uh, a few years ago, when we, when we started using pictometry technology, I think the first, first year we found $32 million of undocumented real estate in Jefferson County. That was real estate that wasn't even on the tax row. So there, we know that there are things out there that exist that we don't know about. And uh, we love to partner with you to help us uh, do our job better, to be more accurate. If you come across something on, a web, on our website that is incorrect, by all means, please let us know. We have a chat feature on our website now. So you can go on and chat and let us know about these, uh, these uh, inconsistencies or um, you know, these mistakes that we may have that uh, we want to get corrected because we wanna get it as right as we can. And we're glad to have your help. I have, a, I have a quick question for Colleen. Hi, Santosh. How are hey, you? How are, I'm doing great. Good. Hey, Colleen, when I see properties like uh, tri-levels and quad levels, in some cases, you guys have done a great job whether you are separating above grade and below grade. But right. in other cases, it's all lumped together. Yeah. Is there any way? And we use these, this info for comps and so forth. Right. Uh, is there any any plan or anything that you see in the, in the near future where you can start to clean some of that up? Well, I mean, we would love to be able to do that again. Um, we, you know, we are, it is mass, it is mass appraisal. We don't really get to dig down that deep and looking at all this uh, stuff individually on any individual property. Uh, but we are glad again to take your suggestions. And if you come across something or if you want to uh, give us a suggestion suggestion on how to accomplish this. We are glad to take your suggestion, Santosh. And we can do a lot of things today with the technology that we have. Uh, we have more, uh, since we converted a couple of years ago to this newer technology, uh, we, we are able to, you know, do more things with it. So if you have any ideas on, on what we ought to be doing or how to get it better, we are glad to listen. Sometimes uh, you can actually look at the diagram and kind of figure out what is above grade and below grade and picture right. and all of that. So that may be something that might help. Okay. Well, we'll certainly take that into consideration. I'll talk to our field, uh, our field supervisor about that. And, you know, the, again, the, the, big, the big caveat with all of that is that, as Melody said, you know, we don't get to go inside. And so um, 
we have so much work to do <laughs> with, with what we do with the amount of people. We only have two, four, we have six people in our field operation, down from about 15, you know, uh, back in the early 90s. And uh, so we are really with technology trying to do more with less, uh, but we do know we miss things sometimes. And, um, you know, we're glad to try and clean up any mistakes, partner with you. And I will certainly pass that information on about the tries and, and buys to, uh, to see if there's a way we can, we, we can put something in place to try and capture more information on those. Thank you. Um, Colleen, I will say that when we, um, as, as we're canvassing, we are trying to get that information in as we come across them in our canvas, in our daily canvas work. Okay, good. And so, yeah, we're definitely trying to get that information in, but like Colleen said, the, for the amount of parcels that Jefferson County has, our staff is limited, so. Is there any way that the appraisers can, when they do an appraisal, we can give you all that information? Um, because since that they are actually going inside those properties, um, that information would make it a little bit more accurate. And you could put something on the uh, PVA to say that it's been appraised and or that an appraiser has verified the square footage or something like that. That especially when a property changes hands mm -hmm. um, and the uh, tax value may be adjusted at that time. Right. No, I, really I, think, I think that's a great idea. And I think that's something that we are certainly willing to entertain. Uh, you know, of course, uh, the appraiser and the, uh, the, the uh, bank or the customer uh, would have to agree to that because we certainly don't want to get into a situation of liability where we've used an appraise, appraisal that people did not give permission to use. So uh, but they that can flip that in as they are signing their documents at closing. They'd never know. So they wouldn't pay attention to it. <laughs> e. <laughs> now, I don't know who that is, but that's not part of the Y4C2T. I know, I know. I'm just saying. <laughs> you can explain it to them at the closing. Right. That's good. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a good idea. I like that idea a lot. And if um, if the real estate community can find a way to come up uh, with us doing that. And, and it is certainly legal and, you know, talk to Harry about it because um, he'll certainly have some thoughts on it. And, um, and if we can do it, I don't see why we wouldn't do it. There well, are one a couple of things that came up this week with me is a house where there was a bedroom that wasn't six, that was only, was less than seven feet. So that square footage had to be removed from the square footage. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. So was that, was that bedroom? But see, the PVA doesn't, we don't even have bedrooms on our square footage. Right. But the square, uh, I went out and measured that house because I was thinking, because I could touch the ceiling in, in, in one of the bedrooms. I was thinking, okay, is this going to be seven feet and come to turn turn out that entire room was under seven feet. So that square footage had to be removed from right. uh, the calculation because uh, this buyer was going VA, so. I see, okay. Well, those are important things. And we certainly, as I said, is this Marsha asking this question? Yes. Hi, Marsha. So I'm, I'm certain that, you know, we really do want to get we want to get it right. So if there is a way for us to help you and you help us, we are there. And, uh, but it has to be certainly vetted legally through all of the, uh, you know, liability kind of questions. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. I think Becky, Becky Lush, did you have a question? Sorry, I was muted. Um, I was just wondering, does, I mean, Marsha's talking about ANSI standards, what, what, um, what appraisers go by, you know, right. as far as heights, non-standard, non-conforming, right. does the PBA even care about ANSI standards? I mean, is that what you would go by judging tax value? No, I mean, we, you know, we go, 
we, we don't have anything to do with ANSI or, or USPAP. You know, we don't, we don't get into the legal um, side of appraisals. Uh, now, you know, we do, we do uh, certainly accept an appraisal when you are appealing your property value. Uh, and that's something that you can use as part of your, you know, uh, substantiating uh, a document that, that uh, proves your opinion of value as a taxpayer. But we don't get into, we don't have anything to do with ANSI or, or USPAP at all. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Nice to see you. Or at least nice to see your name. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a quick question, please. Sure. Um, this is Alyssa Withrow. Pertaining to the homesteading, the homesteaders tax exemption, who all has to be over the age of 65 on the deed for that to apply? Just, Just one, one person. What if it's, I mean, right now we're seeing so many uh, more blended families where, I mean, I've got a closing next week where there's a grandparent and the grandchildren. So does that house then, because the grandparent is 65 and older, that would still apply even though there's grandchildren? Is the grandparent on the deed? Yes. Absolutely. As, as, as long as they are occupying the residence as their primary residence, then yes. Yeah. What happens when the grandparent passes away? Then the exemption is removed. Then it's okay. the, the exemption is either removed or transferred to another 65 year old occupant. Thank you so much. Yeah. The other thing that, that uh, we, we haven't talked about, Mel, you might want to uh, uh, discuss this is putting the property in a trust if you have a disabled uh, uh, person in the home, uh, go ahead, Mel, if you want to explain that. Okay, yeah, if there is a disabled individual in the home, um, like a minor child that is disabled, you can create a, a family trust for the benefit of that child that is um, disabled, and then the property could qualify for the disability exemption in that manner. Um, we do have legal aid on board to help with that, and we do have a private attorney who's willing to help with that. Um, because there's certain ways that the trust has to be written in order for it not to affect the child's benefits, of course. But Right. All right, any are there any other questions out there for Carlene and her team? Well, all right, awesome. Thank you so right. much, Colleen and PVA staff for coming, for educating us about all of these things that we need to know. It's super valuable. I appreciate it so much. You're most welcome. And again, please use our website, use our chat, call our office. We are glad to help. And as we get, you know, all property, before we close real quick, all property is assessed for value as of January 1 of every year. And then, uh, Usually around the last week of April, we will send out assessment notices. If your property value has changed, you'll get an assessment notice. And uh, as soon as you receive that assessment notice, you can appeal. You can go right to our website. We have a very friendly online tool that you can access. Or if you need assistance, we'll be out at the local libraries uh, in those areas that are being reassessed. The other thing, uh, before we close is that you can re you can uh, uh, appeal your property value every year if you choose. You don't have to wait until the year that you're reassessed. You can appeal it every year. So if you're not successful uh, next year, keep keep appealing it uh, and and learn you know what you need to do to to be successful. So again, thank you all so much. I'm so glad to see so many great friends. Thanks for having us and go KW. Awesome. Thank you, Colleen. And any of you who have attended one of Brad's listing classes or his sales classes, he'll be the first to tell you that you need to be on that website every single day, looking at these properties, double checking the information that's in the listing, making sure that, that, you know, they're, that everything is cross-checked and double-checked. So I know I live on your website. Constantly. That's great. <laughs> Thank Good. you. Awesome. And if you come across changes, please feel free to send us an email. The email at the bottom of the website comes directly to Colleen and I, so we're happy to get that information updated for you. And if you have ideas for our story map, if you, if you know something about your neighborhood that we don't know, 
Let us know. Send us an email. Uh, what is that customer service email again, Melody? Um, the customer service is customer service at jeffersonpva.ky.gov. Can you put that in the chat for everyone, please? Sure. Send us an email. We'll be glad to respond. And uh, let us know. Share your information with us. If you, if you uh, know some things about neighborhoods that you would like to see included on the story map, let us know. Awesome, awesome. Thank you all so much. Now go make those phone calls. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Bye. All right, everybody, that concludes our meeting for the day. I hope you all have an excellent rest of your week. Um, there were some questions about that worksheet. What I will, I will get with Amy, and we can upload that maybe to the docs section on Facebook or something like that. That sound good, Amy? OK, she says yes. So we'll put that in Facebook documents so that you can access it there. All right, everybody have a great day.